Hey, what's up garden friends? Jeff here, how's everybody doing? I hope you're good, I am great. Been out here trying to get some stuff done in between the seemingly constant storms. And I was looking at this fuchsia and realized it might need some deadheading, maybe it doesn't. And then as the more I thought about it, I was like, hey, this might be a good thing to talk about. Not your typical looking fuchsia, but this is the fuchsia Trephyla Gartenmeister. It's a hybrid fuchsia. And this fuchsia is a more tropical fuchsia, which is particularly nice because it means they're a little bit more heat tolerant. I mean, in comparison to your typical fuchsia, they're much, much, much more heat tolerant. The hardy zones nine and up, they get, I think they max out around three feet tall, about two to three feet wide. They do tend to grow upright when they're smaller and then they kind of fall back and branch out and have more of a trailing habit, sort of, as they get bigger. Like you can see right here, this particular stem is doing its own thing. It's kind of been driving me crazy. Usually as those stems get bigger and bigger and bigger, they start to fall over and makes much more sense. But no, we got, there's a rebel over here in the basket. They like fall to part shade. I have noticed as with a lot of plants that your flowering is going to be better with a little bit more sun, but not too much because they will scorch and it's more afternoon sun that's a problem. Bright morning light for a couple of hours and then having it filtered throughout the rest of the day, typically okay with these guys. And just like a typical fuchsia, they are moisture lovers. They don't like to dry out for very long. I have noticed that, I mean, just like with a regular fuchsia, if you water these in the heat of the day, especially in the afternoon, doesn't always work out that well for them. These are less sensitive to that though than your typical regular fuchsia. So I do still try to make sure though that mine get watered in the morning time. I have them hooked to drip, so that makes a really big difference, makes it a lot easier to grow them when they're on drip. It helps provide them with the consistently moist soil that they prefer. Like I said, they don't really like to dry out. They shouldn't be soggy. Soggy's problematic. Soggy meaning that like the soil, if you were to squeeze it, has some drip to it. You don't want to do that. That doesn't work out for them. An organically rich, consistently moist soil is important, needs to drain well, and slightly acidic is also preferred. Now this plant in particular, I picked up pre-potted, was super cheap. I was at Home Depot, they had two of them. They're like $12, which is fantastic for a plant this size. These are really big. I said these, there's another one. See, there's the other one hanging up over there. There are different variations with the Fuchsia Gartenmeister, that Fuchsia hybrid, the Fuchsia Trifila Gartenmeister. There's one called like Bowerstead, something like that. There are some variegated ones, which uh, I will show and talk about in just a moment. And with these variations, there's some difference in the foliage. It can be a darker, more bronzy color. And sometimes you'll have more of a brick red flower versus these, which is more of a coral pink. And I really, really enjoy the flowers on this one. They're very honeysuckle-like. They resemble my favorite honeysuckle, which is the Major Wheeler. Yeah, Major Wheeler. I have that over in my garden. It's not quite the same, but I'll, I'll show you real quick. And it's because of this particular color on the flowers that I really like this one. It's luminous. I've talked in other videos how I like things that light up at nighttime, which you can see back here in this one that's hanging up near the light. They just glow. They're beautiful. Oh, Oh, and the hummingbirds, I mean, no surprise here, right? With those trumpet shaped flowers, they love these. They are all over these all the time. Now, this fuchsia typically is sterile. They do, they put out their flowers here. They flower on new wood and then the flowers kind of fade out along the stem. So down here, those were the oldest flowers, they've fallen off and they're still gonna produce their little berries, their fruit, but they're pretty much sterile. This fuchsia gets propagated by cuttings. I think better to do that in the springtime with some heat underneath them, but you could probably give it a shot any time of year. In the heat, like hot, hot heat, may not go as well. They're not too hard to propagate though, to get rooted. I do like to deadhead mine. You can kind of see here how the flowers are starting to fade out. It's not like you see how they're loose and falling off. They're pretty much done. For the sake of the video, I'm going to go ahead and prune it back now, but don't really have to quite yet. I could wait a little bit longer. This is more of a cutback than a deadheading. It's not really deadheading. Deadheading would be just pulling off the spent flowers. This is a cutback. I generally like to go at least three nodes below the flower. So <laughs> there were leaves up here. So I'd go back one, two, three. I could even go to here. That'd be a pretty heavy cutback, but I think it would be fine with that. Then come in and add an angle and I just make that cut right above there. Went in and cut off one to two nodes below, which is fine too. The main point is to encourage it to branch out, put out new wood. New wood is going to keep flowering. Yeah, I'm not gonna do the entire thing right now. I'm losing sunlight. 
but I do have some others that I want to pot up. So we'll go ahead and mix up some potting soil and talk about that. And see, here is that other fuchsia. The variety is called Upright Firecracker, which is totally hiding in there, but that's what it's called. It's another Gartenmeister hybrid, Trifila Gartenmeister. Naming gets complicated, but it has a lighter foliage. It's variegated, a very creamy variegation, has some hints of pink in it, and the flowers are absolutely beautiful, like a hot pink. Big fan of the colors on this one. Then here I have a hanging basket. I picked this up from Walmart in a vlog, I mean, several months ago. It's a standard potting mix. There is a bunch of sand in here because I actually mixed the batch up for palm trees. So what I've done here is I'm adding in some hardwood bark chips. That's going to keep it from compacting. You know, something sand does when it's wet, it compacts. Anybody who's ever made a sand castle, you know what I'm talking about. And this does need to drain freely. And sand, while it does help with drainage, it also compacts and it retains moisture as well. There's also a little bit of a spum of holly tone in here. The reason for that is that, like I mentioned, they like things slightly on the acidic side. So here I have an organically rich potting mix. They have those bark chunks in there to help create a little bit more, not air pockets, but to just kind of lighten things up a little bit. So when this gets watered, the water will move through it a little bit more quickly and not hold on to moisture for too terribly long. Because even though they like their soil to be consistently moist, it having the ability to dry somewhat in between, just like the top maybe half inch of soil or so, is still a good thing. That helps cut back on problems like uh, rot. These are very prone to rot. They have insect vulnerabilities, whitefly scale, aphids, and pretty much all of them. It's more the rot though that's a problem, particularly when it's really hot outside and they're wet. That's when things can be problematic, like a verticillum rot. And this is potted up in what appears to be mostly straight up peat. I'm gonna go ahead and try and work a lot of that out and then pot it in there. Okay, it's a little bit dirty, but storms are moving in. That's why it's so dark. So just gotta move on with things. This is a creeping Jenny over the front. It's dirty because I just ripped it out of my garden, cleaned the roots out and popped it in here. I also want to mention that the soil I have mixed up in there also has some Espoma Biotone starter in it, which is important. Their roots are very delicate and uh, maybe you might remove the PD or maybe coconut core, whatever they have it potted up in. Maybe when you remove that, it might lose a lot of its roots. Not that that's what happened here, I'm just saying. Yeah, no, that's totally what happened. It lost a lot of roots. Like I kind of tapped it and just poof, whole thing fell apart. That means it wasn't well rooted in its pot anyways, which is no surprise because it was potted up in a medium that doesn't have much to it. These fuchsias are somewhat heavy feeders. I fertilize my fuchsias once a month with an all purpose fertilizer throughout pretty much the entire growing season. So May, June, July, August, and September's tricky. September's tricky because you can overwinter these indoors fairly easily. So if you're going to do that, if you want to take them inside, it's best to stop the fertilizing about six weeks before it's time to move the plants in. So for me, that's about mid-October. So September, I probably wouldn't fertilize. It might get one fertilizing the first week, but it's kind of time to harden the plant off. Which essentially means cut back on fertilizing, start to cut back on watering a little bit, adjust their light if necessary. So if it's getting a lot of light, then it would be time to go ahead and move that plant to a space that's more dark with this plant, with the fuchsia that's not likely going to be the case because July, August, September here, pretty toasty. When it gets warmer and warmer and warmer, as temperatures hit the mid 90s, I reduce the amount of light they get. Just helps keep them a little bit more cool. It does unfortunately influence their flowering, however. That, that part kind of stinks. The more light they get, the more they'll flower, but if they get too much light when it's hot outside, then that can be problematic. But that is one of the things that's so incredibly nice about this hybrid fuchsia, the Gartenmeister. They can take the heat so much better than your typical fuchsia can. It's a different look. It's not really a substitute necessarily unless maybe you're just growing it because of the like the hummingbird and pollinator aspect i have typically found the hummingbirds to go to these guys before they go to my other fuchsias and the thing i like most about them isn't just that their flowers are gorgeous i love the vibrancy of those flowers but it's that I don't have to worry about them rotting in the heat of summer when things get wet. That's what happens with a typical fuchsia, and if you feel it's someplace warm. These are a good fuchsia for the Midwest and other areas alike. It's hot, it's humid, kind of muggy. There's afternoon showers. Afternoon showers aren't always the best thing for plants that don't want to be sopping wet when it's really hot outside, and they don't want to be dry either. So still, she's pretty, but high maintenance. Nowhere near as high maintenance as the other though that's i've said that right you get it i have seen these um overwintered and grown as perennials in zone eight before most of the websites i've been checking are saying zone nine so i just like to stick with what's the popular opinion but 
I've seen them in zone eight and like grown as very large, nice shrubs. So I think it's one of those things where maybe it's a roll the dice kind of plant. There are a lot of those when you get up towards zone eight and zone nine, there are a lot of things where it's like, okay, it says zone nine, but I'm in zone eight and it doesn't usually get that cold during winter. So uh, we'll see what happens. Hopefully we just won't have a bad winter. I mean, I do that with zone seven plants in my zone six garden a lot. And sometimes it's successful, but not lately. <laughs> not the last few years. It's been very cold. Indoors, do not fertilize. You don't need to cut back on watering. Let them be with their foliage. Treat them as a house plant give them really bright light. Decent airflow helps a lot and water them when the top half inch of soil dries out. Indoors, uh, white fly problem, spider mites, big problem. They do like a somewhat humid environment, especially cooler temperatures. Like if it's in the seventies in your house and you can keep the air fairly humid, then that's gonna help cut back on things like spider mites an awful lot. And hey, it's a small plant. So if that does become a problem, you can take it to a sink, take it to the shower, wash it off, and then spray it down with neem oil, something, make sure it like drips off the plant, runs all over the plant, repeat as necessary. I mean, like probably weekly until you're assured that the problem's gone. It's just unlikely that's going to keep flowering when it's inside. It's not likely going to get enough light and warmth, but sometimes they'll throw out a few. Kind of like a hibiscus. If you ever grown a hibiscus inside, sometimes not a problem. Sometimes they don't really like it. I think it's worth trying just because they're absolutely beautiful plants. I don't know if they're toxic though. Hold on, I'll Google it. All right, I'm looking at gardening know-how here on my phone. It says, can you eat fuchsia? The French monk and botanist Charles Plumier discovered fuchsia in the island. That's what, can you just, I just need a yes or no, please. Okay, they're basically saying they're non-toxic, but I'm more curious about whether or not they're toxic to uh, pets. All right, I can't find anything that's giving me a 100% straight answer. Things are, like I said, alluding to them being edible by people. At least the berries, the seeds, the little seed pods. But if something doesn't say yes or no 100%, I'm not going to tell you because I'm not going to be responsible for that. Keep your plants where your pets and any person who might eat them keep it where they're not going to get to them. Okay, so that was a little bit of a waste of time, but it just seemed nicer to look it up than say Google it yourself. Okay, that's it. Okay, running out of battery super fast here. This is, I'm filming in 4K this time. Oh my goodness, the battery life, not good. Not good at all. As always, comment down below any tips, tricks, anything I've missed or that needs correction. Put it down below, get a conversation going. Let me know some of your experiences growing fuchsias in general, let alone the tropical type, the Gartenmeister Trifila hybrids. As this grows, I'll be sure to post updates on my social media, which is all linked down below in the description. I'm on Instagram like far more than anything else. I look forward to seeing this one grow. It is so pretty. I love the variegated foliage with those pink flowers. It's little, but it'll fill out. It's getting lost amongst all of the colors back there. Hey, and if you liked the video, hit that thumbs up button. I really do appreciate it. It makes a big difference for the videos and for the channel, so thank you. And subscribe as well, and hit that notification bell. I upload multiple times a week, and that way you'll know when new videos come out. Alright, everybody, as always, and most importantly, Oh my gosh, I'm down to 2%. Keep on. Oh, that's a pretty view. I need to film some B-roll and insert that somewhere in this video. Keep on growing. Bye-bye.